Story Seven of the House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story Seven: My Life, the Story of a Provincial, Parts Eight and Nine. Part Eight. One evening, when I came home late from Maria Viktorovna's, I found a young policeman in a new uniform in my room. He was sitting by the table reading. At last, he said, getting up and stretching himself, this is the third time I have been to see you. The governor has ordered you to go and see him tomorrow at nine o'clock sharp. Don't be late. He made me give him a written promise to comply with his excellency's orders and went away. This policeman's visit and the unexpected invitation to see the governor had a most depressing effect on me. From my early childhood I have had a dread of gendarmes, police, legal officials, and I was tormented with anxiety, as though I had really committed a crime, and I could not sleep. Nurse and Prokofy were also upset and could not sleep. And to make things worse, Nurse had an earache, and moaned, and more than once screamed out. Hearing that I could not sleep, Prokofy came quietly into my room with a little lamp and sat by the table. "'You should have a drop of pepper brandy,' he said after some thought. "'In this veil of tears things go on all right when you take a drop, and if mother had some pepper brandy poured into her ear she would be much better.' About three he got ready to go to the slaughterhouse to fetch some meat. I knew I should not sleep until morning, and to use up the time until nine I went with him. We walked with the lantern, and his boy, Nikolka, who was about thirteen, and had blue spots on his face, and an expression like a murderer's, drove behind us in a sledge, urging the horse on with hoarse cries. "'You will probably be punished at the governor's,' said Prokofy as we walked. There is a governor's rank, and an archimandrite's rank, and an officer's rank, and a doctor's rank, and every profession has its own rank. You don't keep to yours, and they won't allow it. The slaughterhouse stood behind the cemetery, and till then I had only seen it at a distance. It consisted of three dark sheds surrounded by a grey fence, from which, when the wind was in that direction in summer, there came an overpowering stench. Now, as I entered the yard, I could not see the sheds in the darkness. I groped through horses and sledges, both empty and laden with meat, and there were men walking about with lanterns and swearing disgustingly. Prokofy and Nikolka swore as filthily, and there was a continuous hum from the swearing and coughing and the neighing of the horses. The place smelled of corpses and awful, the snow was thawing and already mixed with mud, and in the darkness it seemed to me that I was walking through a pool of blood. When we had filled the sledge with meat, we went to the butcher's shop in the market-place. Day was beginning to dawn. One after another the cooks came with baskets, and old women in mantles. With an axe in his hand, wearing a white blood-stained apron, Prokofy swore terrifically and crossed himself, turning toward the church, and shouted so loud that he could be heard all over the market, avowing that he sold his meat at cost price and even at a loss. He cheated in weighing and reckoning, the cooks saw it, but dazed by his shouting they did not protest, but only called him a gallows-bird. Raising and dropping his formidable axe, he assumed picturesque attitudes and constantly uttered the sound, HACK! with a furious expression, and I was really afraid of his cutting off someone's head or hand. I stayed in the butcher's shop the whole morning, and when at last I went to the governor's, my fur coat smelled of meat and blood. My state of mind would have been appropriate for an encounter with a bear armed with no more than a staff. I remember a long staircase with a striped carpet and a young official in a frock coat with shining buttons, who silently indicated the door with both hands and went in to announce me. I entered the hall, where the furniture was most luxurious, but cold and tasteless, forming a most unpleasant impression, the tall, narrow pier-glasses and the bright yellow hangings over the windows. One could see that, though governors changed, the furniture remained the same. 
the young official again pointed with both hands to the door and went toward a large green table, by which stood a general with the order of Vladimir at his neck. Mr. Polonyev, he began, holding a letter in his hand and opening his mouth wide so that it made a round O, I asked you to come to say this to you. Your esteemed father has applied verbally and in writing to the provincial marshal of nobility to have you summoned and made to see the incongruity of your conduct with the title of nobleman which you have the honour to bear. His Excellency Alexander Pavlovich, justly thinking that your conduct may be subversive, and finding that persuasion may not be sufficient without serious intervention on the part of the authorities, has given me his decision as to your case, and I agree with him. He said this quietly, respectfully, standing erect, as if I was his superior, and his expression was not at all severe. He had a flabby, tired face, covered with wrinkles, with pouches under his eyes. His hair was dyed, and it was hard to guess his age from his appearance. Fifty or sixty. I hope, he went on, that you will appreciate Alexander Pavlovich's delicacy in applying to me, not officially, but privately. I have invited you unofficially, not as a governor, but as a sincere admirer of your father's and I ask you to change your conduct and to return to the duties proper to your rank, or, to avoid the evil effects of your example, to go to some other place where you are not known and where you may do what you like. Otherwise I shall have to resort to extreme measures." For half a minute he stood in silence, staring at me, open-mouthed. "'Are you a vegetarian?' he asked. "'No, Your Excellency. I eat meat.' He sat down and took up a document, and I bowed and left. It was not worth while going to work before dinner. I went home and tried to sleep, but could not because the unpleasant sickly feeling from the slaughterhouse and my conversation with the governor. And so I dragged through till the evening, and then, feeling gloomy and out of sorts, I went to see Maria Viktorovna. I told her about my visit to the governor, and she looked at me in bewilderment, as if she did not believe me, and suddenly she began to laugh merrily, heartily, stridently, as only good-natured, light-hearted people can. "'If I were to tell this in Petersburg,' she cried, nearly dropping with laughter, bending over the table, "'if I could tell them in Petersburg!' End of Part 8 Part 9. Now we saw each other often, sometimes twice a day. Almost every day after dinner she drove up to the cemetery, and as she waited for me, read the inscriptions on the crosses and monuments. Sometimes she came into the church and stood by my side and watched me working. The silence, the simple industry of the painters and gilders, Reddish's good sense, and the fact that outwardly I was no different from the other artisans, and worked as they did in a waistcoat and old shoes, and that they addressed me familiarly, were new to her, and she was moved by it all. Once in her presence a painter who was working at a door on the roof called down to me, Miss Ale, fetch me the white lead. I fetched him the white lead, and as I came down the scaffolding, she was moved to tears, and looked at me and smiled. "'What a dear you are!' she said. I have always remembered how, when I was a child, a green parrot got out of its cage in one of the rich people's houses, and wandered about the town for a whole month, flying from one garden to another, homeless and lonely. And Maria Viktorovna reminded me of the bird. "'Except to the cemetery,' she said with a laugh, "'I have absolutely nowhere to go. The town bores me to tears.' People read, sing, and twitter at the Asequins, but I cannot bear them lately. Your sister is shy. Miss Blagovo, for some reason, hates me. I don't like the theatre. What can I do with myself? When I was at her house, I smelled of paint and turpentine, and my hands were stained. She liked that. She wanted me to come to her in my ordinary working clothes, but I felt awkward in them in her drawing-room and as if I were in uniform, 
and so I always wore my new serge suit. She did not like that. "'You must confess,' she said once, "'that you have not got used to your new role. A working man's suit makes you feel awkward and embarrassed. Tell me, isn't it because you are not sure of yourself and are unsatisfied? Does this work you have chosen, this painting of yours, really satisfy you?' she asked merrily. I know paint makes things look nicer and wear better, but the things themselves belong to the rich, and after all they are a luxury. Besides, you have said more than once that everybody should earn his living with his own hands, and you earn money, not bread. Why don't you keep to the exact meaning of what you say? You must earn bread, real bread. You must plough, sow, reap, thrash, or do something which has to do directly with agriculture, such as keeping cows, digging, or building houses. She opened a handsome bookcase, which stood by the writing-table, and said, I'm telling you all this, because I'm going to let you into my secret. Voila! This is my agricultural library. Here are books on arable land, vegetable gardens, orchard-keeping, cattle-keeping, bee-keeping. I read them eagerly, and have studied the theory of everything thoroughly. It is my dream to go to Dubechnia as soon as March begins. It is wonderful there, amazing, isn't it? The first year I shall only be learning the work and getting used to it, and in the second year I shall begin to work thoroughly, without sparing myself. My father promised to give me Dubechnia as a present, and I am to do anything I like with it. She blushed, and with mingled laughter and tears she dreamed aloud of her life at Dubechnia, and how absorbing it would be. And I envied her. March would soon be here. The days were drawing out, and in the bright, sunny afternoons the snow dripped from the roofs, and the smell of spring was in the air. I, too, longed for the country. And when she said she was going to live at Dubechnia, I saw at once that I should be left alone in the town, and I felt jealous of the bookcase with her books about farming. I knew and cared nothing about farming, and I was on the point of telling her that agriculture was work for slaves, but I recollected that my father had once said something of the sort, and I held my peace. Lent began. The engineer, Victor Ivanich, came home from Petersburg. I had begun to forget his existence. He came unexpectedly, not even sending a telegram. When I went there as usual in the evening, he was walking up and down the drawing-room, after a bath, with his hair cut, looking ten years younger, and talking. His daughter was kneeling by his trunks and taking out boxes, bottles, books, and handing them to Pavel, the footman. When I saw the engineer, I involuntarily stepped back, and he held out both his hands and smiled, and showed his strong white cab-driver's teeth. "'Here he is! Here he is! I'm very pleased to see you, Mr. House-Painter. Maria told me all about you and sang your praises. I quite understand you, and heartily approve.' He took me by the arm and went on. It is much cleverer and more honest to be a decent workman than to spoil state paper and to wear a cockade. I myself worked with my hands in Belgium. I was an engine driver for five years. He was wearing a short jacket and comfortable slippers, and he shuffled along like a gouty man, waving and rubbing his hands, humming and buzzing and shrugging with pleasure at being at home again with his favorite shower-bath. There's no denying, he said at supper, there's no denying that you are kind, sympathetic people, but somehow, as soon as you gentlefolk take on manual labor, or try to spare the peasants, you reduce it all to sectarianism. You are a sectarian. You don't drink vodka. What is that but sectarianism? To please him, I drank vodka. I drank wine, too. We ate cheese, sausages, pastries, pickles, and all kinds of dainties that the engineer had brought with him, and we sampled wines sent from abroad during his absence. They were excellent. For some reason the engineer had wines and cigars sent from abroad, duty-free. Somebody sent him caviar and baliki gratis. 
He did not pay rent for his house because his landlord supplied the railway with kerosene, and generally he and his daughter gave me the impression of having all the best things in the world at their service free of charge. I went on visiting them, but with less pleasure than before. The engineer oppressed me, and I felt cramped in his presence. I could not endure his clear, innocent eyes. His opinions bored me and were offensive to me, and I was distressed by the recollection that I had so recently been subordinate to this ruddy, well-fed man, and that he had been mercilessly rude to me. True, he would put his arm around my waist and clap me kindly on the shoulder and approve of my way of living, but I felt that he despised my nullity just as much as before and only suffered me to please his daughter. But I could no longer laugh and talk easily, and I thought myself ill-mannered, and all the time was expecting him to call me Pantely as he did his footman Pava. How my provincial bourgeois pride rode up against him! I, a working man, a painter, going every day to the house of rich strangers, whom the whole town regarded as foreigners, and drinking their expensive wines and outlandish dishes. I could not reconcile this with my conscience. When I went to see them, I sternly avoided those whom I met on the way, and looked askance at them like a real sectarian, and when I left the engineer's house I was ashamed of feeling so well fed. But chiefly I was afraid of falling in love. Whether walking in the street, or working, or talking to my mates, I thought all the time of going to Maria Viktorovna's in the evening, and always had her voice, her laughter, her movements with me. And always, as I got ready to go to her, I would stand for a long time in front of the cracked mirror, tying my necktie. My serge suit seemed horrible to me, and I suffered, but at the same time despised myself for feeling so small. When she called to me from another room to say that she was not dressed yet and to ask me to wait a bit, and I could hear her dressing, I was agitated and felt as though the floor was sinking under me. And when I saw a woman in the street, even at a distance, I fell to comparing her figure with hers, and it seemed to me that all our women and girls were vulgar, absurdly dressed, and without manners and such comparisons aroused in me a feeling of pride. Maria Viktorovna was better than all of them, and at night I dreamed of her and myself. Once at supper the engineer and I ate a whole lobster. When I reached home I remember that the engineer had twice called me my dear fellow, and I thought that they treated me as they might have done a big unhappy dog separated from his master, and that they were amusing themselves with me, and that they would order me away like a dog when they were bored with me. I began to feel ashamed and hurt, went to the point of tears as though I had been insulted, and raising my eyes to heaven, I vowed to put an end to it all. Next day I did not go to the Dolikovs. Late at night, when it was quite dark and pouring with rain, I walked up and down Great Gentry Street, looking at the windows. At the Azequins everybody was asleep, and the only light was in one of the top windows. Old Mrs. Azequin was sitting in her room, embroidering by candlelight, and imagining herself to be fighting against prejudice. It was dark in our house, and opposite at the Dolikovs the windows were lit up, but it was impossible to see anything through the flowers and curtains. I kept on walking up and down the street. I was soaked through with the cold March rain. I heard my father come home from the club. He knocked at the door. In a minute a light appeared at a window, and I saw my sister walking quickly with her lamp and hurriedly arranging her thick hair. Then my father paced up and down the drawing-room talking and rubbing his hands, and my sister sat still in a corner, lost in thought, not listening to him. But soon they left the room, and the light was put out. I looked at the engineer's house, and that too was now dark. In the darkness and the rain I felt desperately lonely, cast out at the mercy of fate, and I felt how 
compared with my loneliness and my suffering, actual and to come, all my work and my desires and all that I had hitherto thought and read were vain and futile. Alas! the activities and thoughts of human beings are not nearly so important as their sorrows. And not knowing exactly what I was doing, I pulled with all my might at the bell at the Dolikov's gate, broke it, and ran away down the street like a little boy, full of fear, thinking they would rush out at once and recognize me. When I stopped to take breath at the end of the street, I could hear nothing but the falling rain, and far away a night watchman knocking on a sheet of iron. For a whole week I did not go to the Dolikovs. I sold my serge suit. I had no work, and I was once more half-starved, earning ten or twenty kopecks a day, when possible, by disagreeable work. Floundering knee-deep in the mire, putting out all my strength, I tried to drown my memories and to punish myself for all the cheeses and pickles to which I had been treated at the engineer's. Still, no sooner did I go to bed, wet and hungry, than my untamed imagination set to work to evolve wonderful alluring pictures, and to my amazement I confessed that I was in love, passionately in love, and I fell sound asleep, feeling that the hard life had only made my body stronger and younger. One evening it began most unseasonably to snow, and the wind blew from the north, exactly as if winter had begun again. When I got home from work, I found Maria Viktorovna in my room. She was in her furs, with her hands in her muff. "'Why don't you come to see me?' she asked, looking at me with her bright, sagacious eyes, and I was overcome with joy, and stood stiffly in front of her, just as I had done with my father when he was going to thrash me. She looked straight into my face, and I could see by her eyes that she understood why I was overcome. "'Why don't you come to see me?' she repeated. "'You don't want to come? I had to come to you.' She got up and came close to me. "'Don't leave me,' she said, and her eyes filled with tears. "'I am lonely, utterly lonely.' She began to cry and said, covering her face with her muff, "'Alone! Life is hard, very hard, and in the whole world I have no one but you. Don't leave me.' Looking for her handkerchief to dry her tears, she gave a smile. We were silent for some time. Then I embraced and kissed her, and the pin in her hat scratched my face and drew blood. And we began to talk as though we had been dear to each other for a long, long time. End of Part 9